Welcome, Food Studies 2020 virtual conference. Um, welcome to my paper. This is a full-sized themed paper presentation, so it's going to go longer than the virtual lightning talk. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, so you should hopefully see both me and the presentation. So let's go. Susan Fenimore Cooper's Natural Rural Cattle. Livestock plays an important role in Susan Fenimore Cooper's nature writing of the Cooperstown region. As opposed to wild animals and the frontier of the time of the pioneers, a novel by her father, James Fenimore Cooper, and also set in Cooperstown, in rural hours, in Susan Cooper's rural hours, the land has been thoroughly domesticated by the iconic animal of US domestic husbandry, the cow. Early in rural hours, Cooper writes of neighborly cows returning home from the day's grazing in open pastures. Came home from our walk with the village cows this evening. Some 15 or 20 of them were straggling along the road, going home of their own accord to be milked. Toward evening, they turned their heads homeward without being sent for, occasionally walking at a steady pace without stopping, at other times, loitering and nibbling by the way. Among those we followed this evening were several old acquaintances and probably they all belonged to different houses. Only two of them had bells. As they came into the village, they all walked off to their owners' doors, some turning one direction, some in another. In this scene, the cows accompany Susan Cooper on her walk companionably, almost in a kind of friendship. Their similarity to the human walking companions is highlighted at the end as the figures detach from the group, the cows separating themselves one by one at the appointed time, like a human walking party. This scene establishes to a large part the general tone of the narrative. Cooper and her family are in comfortable conversation with the non-human world around them. Rochelle Johnson writes of three definitions of nature significant during this period in US literature. Nature is national progress, nature as the refinement of the American people, and nature is human reason. I focus primarily on the first two meanings of nature in Cooper's work. Nature is both refining and a means of progress that she engages with, agrees with, and occasionally questions throughout her writings on rural agriculture. In this essay, I examine scenes in rural hours where Cooper shows her preference for small-scale farming concerns, focusing on cattle. Throughout the work, she idealizes sustainable farming practices of her time, warns her readers of the dangers of over-harvesting and deforestation, alludes as well to the Iroquois who inhabited the region of Cooperstown before the Euro-American settlers, and finally voices her fears for the West at the hands of the frontier communities. Susan Cooper surpassed her father in terms of writing creative nonfiction, publishing her best known work, Rural Hours, in 1850. Editors Rochelle Johnson and Daniel Patterson note, Rural Hours presents what ultimately emerges as Cooper's argument for a sustainable balance between human culture and its natural surroundings. She argues for sustainable agriculture throughout rural hours. Furthermore, she places herself in the constellation of 19th century US nature writers predating Thoreau's Walden by four years. Lawrence Buell names rural hours the first and still the most ambitious seasonal compendium published by an American author. Cooper neatly lays out this domestic image. I'll examine it specifically as it concerns cattle-based livestock in her journal style natural essay that focuses on the Cooperstown region over the course of four seasons. As early as English colonization of North America, the cows brought with the Europeans, actually in addition to the English, but I'll be focusing on the English, were appreciated for their meat and dairy products. Though pigs and chickens were the primary meat producing animals during the early period of US history, cows were even then predominant as aspirational representative animals for Euro-American farmers. The nation expanded West in the early 19th century largely because of the needs of their livestock. Virginia de John Anderson historicizes livestock as a colonizing tool in North America, reasoning that the establishment of populations of cattle and other domestic animals was a key project for early British colonists to the continent, as well as with the region's native tribes and nations as they sought to navigate their changing world. Even as early as the 17th century, livestock were inexorably linked to Euro-American expansion, taking on a commodity status as part of a global economics. As New Englanders turned cheap grazing lands into profit through beef cattle, Caribbean colonizers were able to focus on increasing their profits in the production of sugar, perhaps the largest global industry of the time. And this focus on livestock and trade, relying on ostensibly cheap North American grazing lands, continued into the 19th century. Anderson notes, these people and animals shaped the course of colonial history because of their interactions, not their separation from one another. 
Describing modern agriculture in a way that applies as well to a discussion of 19th century narratives, Donald Klingborg observes that husbandry implies a moral responsibility on the part of the owner to care and provide for the animals under their care. And that's Cooper's focus. At this time, the nation sought to add land to its borders through virtually any means necessary. The Louisiana Purchase of 1803, the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the Mexican-American War ending with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and the ongoing Indian Wars throughout the century resulted in vastly larger physical borders for the United States throughout the 19th century. It is directly against this agro-expansionist viewpoint that Cooper is arguing in rural hours. Thus, Cooper's regional attention to place in Cooperstown is intentional. The small and the local are privileged over the expansive. Descended from William and James Cooper, living in a town named Cooperstown, Susan Cooper felt the weight of legacy and her rootedness to the region. Indeed, the early Coopers were instrumental in agricultural pursuits in the region, founding early agricultural societies. Cooper's focus on the domestic and agriculture is thus familiar. To this, though, she also adds an interest in resource management of protecting wild spaces from intensifying agriculture. Her nature writings combine an appreciation for the natural world with the rural form of Euro-American agriculture. Opposed to developing U.S. agro-expansion, the key issues of resource management and stewardship had already become a significant concern against which she was working in her writings. Cattle and other livestock, therefore, play a dominant role throughout rural hours, though not as part of an expansionist agriculture. Rather, Susan Cooper describes her example of the B family farm. She doesn't name them, she just gives the initial. As her ideal, they're moderate and not expansive. Her approved form of agriculture is one that manages its resources appropriately, practicing proper stewardship of the land. The elderly couple running this farm seek to, with their, with one son, seek to maintain themselves rather than to grow more wealth. They kept four cows, Cooper writes. Formerly, they had a much larger dairy, but our hostess had counted her three score and 10 and being the only woman in the house, the dairy work of four cows, she said, was as much as she could well attend to. The entirety of this picture is connected to cows, the predominance of cattle, while not beef cattle is noteworthy in the scene. Even a retired farm woman considers four dairy cows to be a necessity to a well-maintained household. This image of idealized rural domesticity follows the standards of 19th century US domestic management as well, which would have been appreciated by the likes of Catherine Beecher or Lydia Maria Child. Formerly, Susan Cooper observes, the Bee family cared for more cattle in their dairy. In their retirement, though, their desires have changed, presumably, and they have reduced their investments in cattle. This picture runs counter to the expansive ideal of the 19th century U.S. frontier. The Bee family farm can be physically and economically sustained by three people, the dairy portion of the farm run by one elderly woman. Reducing is honored over expanding in this example, and Cooper returns her readers to earlier U.S. agrarianism, idealizing small farms and encouraging her readers to value this economical mode of life. Cooper next describes the agricultural production of other goods on the farm, where the bee family produces almost all they consume. This is a standard that would be challenged, really placed under threat, following industrialization and agro-expansion throughout the century. In the spring, a calf was killed. In the fall, a sheep and a couple of hogs. Once in a while, at other seasons, they got a piece of fresh meat from some neighbor who had killed a beef or a mutton. Cooper continues, they rarely eat their poultry. The hens were kept chiefly for eggs and their geese for feathers. This was the assumed normal level of production even into the 19th century. People living on these small scale farms consumed mostly beef, pork, and poultry that was produced on site. When James Fenimore Cooper was writing, though, the nation was already committed to moving west. Therefore, by the time of Susan Fenimore Cooper, a generation later, the idea of this farm was already nostalgic, no longer the norm for the nation. Along with western expansion was agricultural intensification, where cattle and other domestic animals were produced in great surplus quantities, no longer at the subsistence level. However, the agricultural practices of this ideal farmstead connect to Cooper's overall argument in rural hours as she here acknowledges the, idea, the need for your Americans to emulate this idealized farmstead rather than the other agro-expansionist model. Agriculture is a noble act, she maintains. She doesn't argue for humans to avoid manipulating the natural world at all. However, she argues that they should practice an appropriate level of respect for the non-human world. Furthermore, in rural hours, Susan Cooper applauds the increase, whoops, Furthermore, in rural hours, Susan Cooper applauds the increase of crop production. While she mostly describes vegetable crops, she also notes the herds of cattle in the area with pride. Year after year, from the early history of the country, the land has yielded her increase in cheerful abundance. 
and at eventide the patient kind yielding their nourishing treasure, stem lowing at every door. Cooper indicates her attitudes towards moderate increase, the natural cheerful abundance of the patient kind or cattle, their beef and dairy a nourishing treasure, maintaining her national and cultural attitudes about the appropriate uses of land and agriculture. Indeed, she reminds her readers, it needs not to be a great agricultural establishment with scientific sheds and show dairies. A simple body who goes to enjoy and not to criticize will find enough to please him about any common farm, provided the goodman be sober and industrious, the housewife be neat and thrifty. Now this Cooper, against the expanding modernizing element in US agriculture during this period, rather she encourages her readers to return to a small scale form of agrarianism that includes livestock. She does not want the pure form of nature that does not include humans, but rather the middle landscape of Leo Marx. Moreover, she emphasizes good stewardship throughout rural hours, both in her exemplary farm family scene, as well as her later writings of deforestation and displacement of the Iroquois, the fear of destruction of populations of the Great Plains, and the decimation of human populations that would be occasioned by that loss. Interestingly, Cooper spends little time, therefore, on people that lived in the Otsego region before her now threatened small-scale Euro-American farmers. The Iroquois, or Haudenosaunee, are described largely through the vanished Indian trope throughout her writings. She notes, for example, there are already many parts of this country where an Indian is never seen. She goes on, though, to acknowledge that Cooperstown is physically within the former bounds of the Six Nations, and a remnant of the great tribes of the Iroquois still linger about their old haunts and occasionally cross our path. Adding significantly, when it is remembered that the land over which they now wander as strangers in the midst of an alien race was so lately their own, the heritage of their fathers, it is impossible to behold them without a feeling of peculiar interest. Cooper does try to value the fact that the land whose change she currently laments is being lamented as well by another community. This double lamentation though is easy for her neighbors of Cooperstown to neglect as they are able to ignore the, ignore the Iroquois if they so desire. The Iroquois appear only occasionally and their present haunts rather than truly becoming a tangible experience. Importantly though, Cooper recognizes that the Iroquois are not gone, and in fact, they are here and, quote, interesting. Paula Gunn Allen warns against taking a static view of Native American characters in li literature. Stasis is not characteristic, she says, of the American Indians' view of things. As any American Indian knows, all of life is living, that is, dynamic and aware, end quote. While lamenting the history of Euro-American and Native relations in the New York region, Cooper does not offer suggestions that would allow the tribes and nations of the Otsego to practice or return to their own agriculture. Her ethic of stewardship responds to the loss of small scale farms like those of the expanding US West, as, as well as to a lesser extent, the earlier losses felt by the Iroquois and other indigenous communities. As part of her challenge against the attitudes of the nation during Western migration and the agri expansion, Cooper imagines the results of the Indian removals and Indian wars that would last much of the rest of the century by describing her fears for the bison of the Great Plains. She declares, the reckless extermination of the game of the United States would seem indeed without a precedent in the history of the world. Probably the buffalo will be entirely swept from the prairies, once covered with their herds by this generation. In keeping with Cooper's ongoing argument for sustainable domestic agriculture, specifically focused on various kinds of cattle, rather than the expansionist tendencies she's witnessing and feared would lead to environmental degradation, even if she would not have used that language at her time, she also laments the fate of the Iroquois and reads that onto the peoples of the Great Plains. In some ways, her romanticization of the bee farm is a negation of Iroquois domestic history, a negation that has dated back through at least three generations of Cooper's. In addition, though, she discusses her fears of deforestation and the extermination of the bison in a way that can be comparable to scenes of her father's writings, like the hunt of the passenger pigeons in the pioneers and even the bison in the prairie, especially as Susan Cooper was her father's amanuensis. In some ways, then, Cooper uses this conflation to foreshadow the bloodshed to come for the Great Plains nations and tribes, as well as the animals living in the path of westward expansion, namely, the other form of cattle in North America, the bison. Three entities are compared in Cooper's literalized discussion of the natural occurrences in Cooperstown, the local flora and fauna, small-scale Euro-American farmers, and indigenous farmers. While not going so far as to privilege the agriculture of the Iroquois over her Euro-American neighbors, she does credit them with not destroying their natural habitat in the way that she fears other Cooperstown farmers, not including the bee family, were doing through deforestation and overharvesting. harvesting 
Finally, rural hours is an innately ethical work in keeping with her family's Christian background. However, as opposed to many of her contemporaries as forms of Christianity, Susan Cooper's ethics involved an appreciation of the natural world for its own sake. While she showed through farms like that of the Bee family that a certain kind of human intervention in nature was appropriate, she also argues that the nation's settlers must exercise care and humility as they continued developing and expanding into the Western frontier. Her stewardship philosophy desires people to be able to use agriculture appropriately, but also to make it possible to be used so in the future. She's not a leather stocking figure preaching the ways of nature as would be seen in James Fenmore Cooper's writings. Rather, throughout rural hours, Cooper engages with the civilization of the village, of the local, and encourages others to give more emphasis to livestock practices that maintain and sustain the land rather than overuse their natural resources. Thank you for listening to my paper and have a wonderful rest of the conference.